Now, I know that, um, that some of you grumble about the speakers that we've had in the past because <laughs> I'd rather hear Ramtha talk because, you know, the information. But um, I think that everyone that we've had here has been very valuable. And in one way or another, um, they've, they've helped to reconfirm what we've been taught from a completely outside source, and that's one of the reasons that I invite speakers here. Um, this next gentleman I was uh, introduced to through a videotape from my friend Anne Marie, and then her friend, the captain, sent over this videotape of Alex Collier. And so I was just in the mood to listen to this, and I sat down and I immediately liked him and I liked what he had to say and for six hours uh, videotape I was glued to it and one of the reasons that I wanted him to come here is because he addressed issues in this that um, Rantha pioneered really the changes the days to come and really set everyone on the trend of predictions and um, all those sorts of things, but there was certain knowledge that many of you know that was never out there that we've gotten here, in particular about the blue webs and the blue body, uh, the different planes, the spiritual self. Well, this gentleman happened to touch upon some of those subjects and I was intently intrigued about his message. And I felt that this group would be an ideal group for him to come and talk to because uh, simply put, most of us that are in, and I count myself as one of these, in the ad advanced group, um, <laughs> hope so. I do my field work. Anyway, uh, cut our teeth on changes the days to come from Rumpha. You know, when everybody went hysterically running out and pulling their hair out and say, always oh, creating fear in the marketplace, and, you know, all, the, all these politically incorrect things that Ramtha did, well, it turned out to be correct. And one of the issues that was most difficult to handle was becoming self-sufficient and buying our own land and storing our own food, learning to grow it, learning to prepare it, having our own water, moving out of the city, uh, building our projects and preparing. And you know, there's a, there's, there is a, a school of thought within the school that thinks that's sort of silly if we're gods. But, you know, I love what Ramtha throws back on you. So, well, if you're so hot, then you get out there and let's see you do field work. You know, I mean, that sort of puts that issue to rest. And <clears throat> and I'm not so stupid to assume that as much as I know that I would totally depend upon my knowingness to get my body through because I'm still on the journey and I'm still developing as well. Well, I know that this group in particular, he has talked about preparation and about the things that are coming and the war and the 12 days of light and all of those things that some of you may have be getting, starting to get scared to death now. Uh, Mr. Collier has gotten this information from a completely different source. And, well, I felt since Rumpa has not addressed for some time now these issues because his focus has been on preparing us spiritually and training us to be spiritual beings instead of physical beings so that spiritually we can take care of our own bodies. That's where Rumpa's whole agenda has been on, to make us preservable for what's about to happen. Um, Mr. Collier... As information flows right along with what we've been taught and what most of us have sort of come to accept without fear, without understanding. And I pointed out to him, I said, you know, <clears throat> Ramtha is very wise and he says, when you're prepared, you don't have any fear. It's when you're unprepared that you have the fear. And you don't know where to go and where to hide and where, what to eat and how to make it and all of the, everything's turned off, you don't know what to do. Well, preparation is the greatest deterrent for being afraid, and we've had a very great and wonderful teacher who has endeavored to coax us along and, and give us that sense of self-preparation and sustainment. So Mr. Collier's 
contacts have been with the Andromedans, and I just love it. They're blue. And um, he didn't know anything about this group. It was wonderful, and maybe he can give you a little background on that, the group, you know. And so um, when he asked his contacts, they said, yes, we know who Rumpa is. We call him the commander. So I... <laughs> I don't know what you want to do with that. We all know that he has that ability. <laughs> that ability to command. Um, so we're not sure what context to take this in. Also, I want to also prepare you for something else. I know what it's like to have a head full of knowledge and five hours to try to get it all out. It's taken you 20 years to learn it. Mr. Collier has a head full of knowledge. He also has a lot of questions. He has a lot of information. His talk isn't a pat little talk. It isn't written down somewhere and he's memorized it. He has important information on every topic. And I know what it's like to address an issue and then remember that there's other issues to add to that. So I want you to know that he's endeavoring and I've asked him, he said, what can I possibly tell him now? I said, everything you know. Uh, that's a large request, so understand that there's a lot has to come out in the next few hours. And don't get hung up on a particular question. You might make note of it because he does enjoy question and answer sessions that are um, legitimate questions that merit being asked, not what's wrong with my parakeet. but. Uh, pay close attention. Also something else you should be aware of, as with the scholars that have come here, and in particular, uh, having a wonderful interaction with uh, the physicists that have been here, you know. I love tangling it up with them. And the only, the only problem we have is that we're, we, we, we're thinking the same, but our definitions are different, our words are different. Uh, understand, he's going to be describing what he's called as uh, dimensions. Uh, we've been taught planes. He has other words for them. But if you understand that his language is a little bit different, you can follow the context of the knowledge that he's about to impart. And lastly, I want you to know that he has a tremendous burden because I know that when I began to wake up and know things that I wasn't happy about it. It made me really sad. And what made me worse was that I realized that everybody didn't want to wake up and nobody wanted to know what I knew because, because it was uncomfortable and it threatened our security and our little box. I think Mr. Collier is sort of in that place now. He has a tremendous amount of sadness about how do you tell people what's coming and, and knowing what their reception is and knowing they don't want to hear it and knowing what our choices are. So he has a burden and any messenger, and I can tell you, bears that burden, but any messenger worth their salt will live through it and I think he will. So it's my privilege to present to you the lovely, <laughs> the beautiful, <laughs> the esteemed Mr. Alex Collier. Oh, you've embarrassed me. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe we could just do this for three hours. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is the largest crowd I've ever spoke to. I'm usually used to about a, you know, a hundred or something. <laughs> um, I want to thank JZ and, and the school and uh, Ramtha at some point when I get to meet him. Thank you very much for inviting me. I was really uh, surprised and. And I have a friend named Val Valerian, and I 
got on the phone and I called him and I said, hey, what do you know about this bunch? <laughs> and he can attest to it. He says, well, I'm one of that bunch. <laughs> so here I am. Is Val here? <laughs> I want to thank Val for um, putting the information on the Leading Edge webpage. Because of that, it went into Nexus Magazine, and it's gone all over the world uh, on a grassroots level. And it's just great. He takes a lot of risks to share the truth with people. And um, let's give him a hand. <laughs> Okay, um, brief overview, um, I have for 30 years been visited and taken on board by beings who live in the constellation of Andromeda. They are light blue, the, they look like that color of that, but they have no hair. Okay, they're, it's, it's interesting, given quite a few strands of hair away. <laughs> um, <laughs> Used to be a lot more hair here before the contacts, you see. <laughs> this is what 10 years will do. <laughs> um, gosh, I hardly know where to start. Um, there's, they're, they're awesome. They're, they're a very healed race. And, you know, after thinking about it, I think the reason they're so healed is because they have absolute mutual respect for everyone. And they've said that that's the only way we're going to have a healed race and planet, is if we have mutual respect for each other. Uh, and I realize that there's not a lot of that teaching going on anymore in our world. Uh, I've, I've had to look at the character of our race on Earth, um, because I'm, I'm blessed to be able to compare it to something else. And, uh, <clears throat> folks, we got a lot of work to do, and we have a very short time in which to do it. Um, a lot of things are really going to start happening um, around February, March, April of next year. And, um, you know, I wish I could just tell you it's all love and light, but that's just not reality. We live in a duality here. And there are definitely some people screwing races that are screwing with us. And uh, I understand from talking with Jay-Z for about two hours, two and a half hours. It went by in five minutes. So it's true, there is no time. <laughs> um, that you're being taught a lot of what to do, self-sufficiency and self-preservation and being totally self-responsible. It is imperative that what you know when you leave here, you go home and you teach. Because this truth isn't out there. And this is one of the sadnesses that I have is because I have been shown some probable futures. And um, a lot of people don't make it. Two thirds of the planet don't make it in those probable scenarios. And I, I truly don't want that to happen. You know, there are a lot of really good, generous people, but they don't know the truth. They have no way of attaining the truth because of where they are on a consciousness level. And you're all teachers. You're all leaders. You were leaders before you came in here. You were teachers before you came in here. But when you go out of here, from what I understand from, from Val and, and uh, Judy and uh, Judy Pope and talking to uh, Jay-Z and, and Greg, that you're going to walk out of here professors, PhDs. So uh, don't be afraid. The word warrior used to originally meant not being afraid of who you are. Okay, it didn't mean slash him up, cut him up, you know, murder, betray. It didn't mean any of that crap. Okay, it meant not being afraid to be who you are. And you are all true human beings. We are all royalty. And I will get into that. I once asked, um, I'm going uh, to go back. The two beings that come to see me and that I have gone with are two Andromedans, a very tall one who's seven and a half feet tall, almost eight feet. He's 450 pounds, and I mean, he's just like that. <laughs> I 
I, I was very self-conscious. <laughs> you know, it's a male thing. <laughs> um, uh, his name is Morinet. And uh, the shorter one, as they get older, their skin pales, they, they turn to white. Their average life span is, in our linear time would be 2,007 years. So of course you see a lot of changes in that amount of time. <laughs> you know, I mean, hanging out here for 60 years is just a weekend, you know. <laughs> um, and the other one, his name is Phaseus. And Phaseus, in our linear time, is 4,300 years old. He is considered a sage in his world. And um, he will be crossing over, in other words, he will be moving out of their physicality soon. And uh, in Andromeda, when somebody makes the crossover, moves out of their physicality, it's a celebration. Um, you know, we're here, unless you're Irish, it's, it's a somber occasion. <laughs> um, you know, the Irish have the great right idea, they party, you know. <laughs> Divide his clothes and everything. <laughs> anyway, I, I once asked Viseas, you know, what was to become of our future? You know, who, what was going to happen to us? And I want to read you this definition of, of what he said. Now, some of you may have already seen it in the, in the magazine or visited Val's website or, you know, seen the bootleg videos that are all over the place. Um, but this is what they said. Responsible freedom of self-determination, becoming truly self-confident and free, to unconditionally be responsible for oneself without being coerced to accept some higher authority. Now, I understand this is exactly what you're being taught. And, uh, I knew, and what's, what's is not, which is really nice is this is confirmation not only for me, but also for, for Jay-Z and, and her people. Because um, I didn't know anything about Jay-Z until about three weeks ago. In fact, I've given channelers a bad rap. <laughs> <laughs> So, what you're witnessing is me eating crow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I don't like to eat crow. <laughs> That's a male thing too, I think. <laughs> oh. Hey, the changes that are coming are really going to affect, from what I've been told by Morning Faseus, the males the most because we are the most shut down, uh, not only genetically, but spiritually as well. I'm not, I'm being, just being general, okay? I'm, I'm not meaning all of you. Um, I'm just pretending like the whole world's listening. Looks like the whole world in here. <laughs> um, one of the most profound things that I had to experience was that I was living in Lake Arrowhead, California at the time. Uh, this is 1987. Contacts had resumed for, the, for two years. And uh, everything in my, I was having a Murphy year. Okay, I don't know, you know Murphy, shit happens. I was having a Murphy year. <laughs> and I was just like, sure, I'll check out of here. You know, the first cab that comes by. Um, anyway, I, uh, Viseas had come to see me, and uh, we had s some discussions. There was more teaching, and anyway, it was time to come back, and I didn't want to come back. And I would have embarrassed all of you the way I carried on. But I just didn't want to. I was just like, you know, nothing's working here. Let's try something different. And, you know, here I am in another reality already. So they were bringing me back. I was literally forced to come back. And as I'm on the ground, and they're, they're leaving, lifting off, um, Phaseus, I hear Phaseus in my head because he, he's telepathic, he's strictly telepathic. Um, he said, Alex, turn around. So I turned around, you know, and I'm just crying and I'm like, oh God, you're abandoning me. And, <laughs> 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 and 
And he just looked at me and he said, Alex, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry lifetime after lifetime. And folks, there's not a day that goes by I don't remind myself of that or I don't think about that. And it's helped me reevaluate all the decisions that I've made in my life. It's also helped me to take myself apart and look at all the little particles of my personality. You know, what's mine and what isn't mine? What are belief systems that I just think are true and what is that I've experienced and really is true? And that took a long, long time, and, and I'm still not done. You know, you're, you're constantly redoing yourself and making yourself over and reevaluating your belief systems. And, you know, our reality here is nothing but belief systems for the most part. And I, I just, you know, I want to pass that on to you because I've made a lot of decisions, and I'm sure a lot of you have where your decisions were not based on love and you literally withheld love for some reason, whatever your reason is. And it's time we grow out of that. We have no choice, okay? Shit's about to hit the fan. And it's really all about love and fear. And fear is withholding love. And I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna read you some things in their own words because they put it far better than I do. Um, Morine has learned to speak English, and there will be a time, probably between sometime between now and just after 2003, if everything goes well, where he will literally be walking here with us. And he wanted to learn English. And his English is not so good, but you can't blame him for that. You've got to blame me for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I did the best I could. What can I tell you? Um, but... <laughs> um, I, I, when they talk to each other, they talk telepathically, and um, their language is holographic, very much like the um, ancient Chinese language or the ancient Japanese. They're literally holographs, but you, you, know, you can't just pull them up off the page. And a holographic language is entire concepts like this. So you will just give one symbol, and in that one symbol is maybe 10,000 years of a history or a meaning or a teaching and um, it's, it's very hard to describe and it's taken me a long time to try to figure it out and they were very very patient in teaching me how to understand their language and I want to do questions and answers because there's so much locked in my head that I have not tapped into yet and unless you ask the question or somebody asks the question it doesn't come up Okay, so I'm, I'm counting on you to ask some really good questions, and if I don't know, I just, I'll tell you, I don't know. Um, in my conversation with, with Jay-Z, uh, she has a very strong foundation because of her teachings with Rampa. I don't talk the same language. I, I, I'm, I'm really a simple, complicated guy. <laughs> That's mine. Okay. So what I want to do is I'm going to read this. I was given this on 11-3, just, just a, a week or so ago, almost two weeks. And it's a current up-to-date of where they're at. And anyway, I'll just read this to you. Um, Alex, we have already spoken with you in detail of your racist genetic transfers and reincarnation before. I will mention them again when necessary because your path and happiness depend on being able to attain the truth. Yes, we are aware of the situation of your planet and it shows great deviation of the right path in the sincerity period. But please, if you would try to share this moment and your planet's evolution as a preparation for the investments which will be made in the very near future for your races. Now there's a whole conversation that preempted this. And basically, I had a contact and I went up there with an attitude. <laughs> you know, I'm a Terran, I got extremes of emotions, you know, and, and I'm really frustrated by a lot of things. You know, I don't understand how the planet's supposed to evolve when nobody wants to hear the truth and most of the truth isn't even available. And I'm extremely frustrated by that. 
you know, uh, and then I hear metaphysicians justify, well, we're teaching the wrong thing, but it's all we have. You know, I, I have a difficult time justifying that. You know, why propagate something that we know isn't real? And that's a whole other issue. When we get to religions, I really want to, like, share with you what I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, this continues. Since the removal of conditions by density technology, your evolution is going to a faster pace, I think you say, than before. We have had to raise the frequency of your planet to move change and enlightenment along. Such a broad word you use, this word enlightenment. It was necessary. This also means great tests of tolerance in situations will be needed by your races. The most important of these tolerances will be caused by delusionary discriminations between your peoples. And folks, this is happening all over the planet, and it's such crap. At, at the present moment, your races are carrying in your DNA genetics the influences of a thousand centuries as you count rotations, that's, you know, one year, both the positive and negative aspects. Please understand we are trying to prepare your races for advanced maturity. At present, many transfers occur in your planet from many different cultures and planes. Each member of the races on and in your planet will naturally exhibit their own mentality. They do and will contradict your habitual cultures. They're very specific about the words they use. In, in fact, you know, I don't even know how they got some of this because I didn't even know some of these phrases. You know, they just like pull it right out of my head and I don't even know what's there. Please do not forget that we have told you about mental conflicts that they cause each to go through tests of maturity. We determine your mentalities through the impulse signals we receive from your race's chains of thoughts. Now the selection of man or woman and the situations they transcend are much more difficult because their preparation of the future is in accordance with their level of consciousness. Alex, you cannot help all your races. Each member of your races will feel their essence in the balancing of positive and negative as they have done and it will be weighed in their own consciousness. Those who prepare and invest will be prepared for the evolution to another density. The continu continuance of your planet, the continents of your planet is changing very quickly. Please don't confuse our compassion for your races with a love for your planet. Please understand that they are separate with our race. We are neither pleased with your world's riches nor dismayed by its poverty. We come, we came to here to assist in the period of sincerity, the clarifying of the original intent in all of us in this vadia. The vadia is a tone that they use, and that particular tone means holograph. They've always referred to all of this as a holograph. Because of lineage to your races, we have returned to you. Your world is a place of veiled consciousness. In order to be embodied in physicalness, all frequencies should be assembled in a whole intent. The very distresses, the many anxieties, are the result of conflict with the limitless awareness in your races. This is the reason why your planet races cannot attain your own selves, and yet you desire to possess everything. The reflections of your evolutionary state of physicality cause your races not to live comfortably on your planet. Your present religions cause your races to unify your physical bodies with your abstract egos. You call this progress. We do not. Stop looking to your physicality to bring you enlightenment. Your bodies are the effect of the cause which is intent, moved by emotion, which creates physicality. This is their perspective. 
during previous past times in your third density, education of the soul took many incarnations of life and death of the physical body. Situations and reincarnations would reflect the system, it appears. All beings would transcend your physicalness in accordance with the degree of consciousness attained. Since it appears that your races, having no concept of the law of consistency, became very fragmented in extremes. Religions became divisions of beliefs and conflicts among your races took place. The worship of belief systems and idolatry came into existence. Reincarnations have become history. And by this means your races, Alex, and others than yours have a probability of directly attaining your full essences. The reason for telling you this in all clarity is to free you of the conflicts and contradictions so your races can attain the truth as soon as possible. So don't ask us about yourself. Ask about yourself to your own self. If your races cannot attain the truth and cannot be unified with your original intent, we will not be able to be in touch with your planet races since the ego consciousness in your races still goes on and since you cannot break the denial of your inner self your races become detrimental to the planet and to your planetary system at this moment there are many beings who cannot attain genuine respect for self and self-awareness in our galaxy they as well are being kept under control their evolutions are being made in an indirect way your races have also been persecuted and manipulated by other galactic races from planetary systems negatively charged other than your own. I'm glad you got that. <laughs> <laughs> Since during your different past time periods they have tried to prove to your ancestors their own technical power. Fear has been created in your races. We have returned to convey the truth, to erase these fears. Since your planet is the site of, of both the most primitive and most high maturity, it is very full of contradictions. Your religions, which have helped many to evolve, have not been released. Your races have refused to let go of a system of beliefs that have not serviced your planet for the last 453 rotations of your star. By freeing you of this, and with the use of common sense, we hope your races will attain your own selves and become fully independent, be it one. Okay. <clears throat> In their perspective, and you know, that's what it is. Um, it, it's, it's obvious that there's just not one truth, there's many truths. Um, the one truth is that we all exist, that we know, okay? That we all have an essence that is undefinable, that is truly eternal. Um, they say that third density, somewhere around just the beginning of December, the year, what we know, linear year of 2013, will implode. It will implode. <laughs> that third density will implode. And look at the auras. Wow, check this out. <clears throat> now, what does that mean? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if this is true, but this is what they say. They're convinced that literally what's going to happen is that there's going to be a graduation out of physicality. It means a lot of us are going home, and it means that a lot of others are starting all over, if this is what's going to happen. Okay? Um, a lot of this has to do with our genetics. Uh, according to the Andromedans, we are, our physicality is the sum total of 22 different races that have come down here, spent the weekend, messed with us, and then took off and went home. <laughs> uh, 
okay, intermingled, you know, left uh, children behind, and just took off. The Egyptian pharaohs are the perfect example of this, okay? The blue bloods, the, the English family, uh, the Rothschilds, who are also blue bloods, are another example of this. Their blood is copper-based, and that's ET, okay? That's ET. And the thing about copper-based blood is that you don't need a lot of oxygen. You tend to, your physicality tends to grow and have a larger lung capacity. Okay? Um, so you can live in a lot of other environments where we couldn't. Now, what's interesting is that in our physicality, what we know as Earth, our atmosphere is getting thinner and thinner. I know that there's a lot of talk about the ozone and it's a myth that it isn't real, that there is no such thing as an ozone crisis, folks. There absolutely is an ozone crisis. Okay? We are destroying the, would I say we, all of us, are partly responsible for this. We are destroying our environment. Um, according to the Andromedans, 3,500 years ago, the oxygen content was between 34 and 38 percent. They say today that it is literally less than 17 percent. Now those of you who have studied biology, what happens to the physical body when the gas, which is oxygen, goes below 15 percent? I'm sorry? Somebody said you die? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Okay, now, why is this happening? Because a group of beings who are Terrans, who are Earth beings, have been made a promise by a group of extraterrestrials that have Orion belief systems that if they will get rid of some of the races on the planet, that the extraterrestrials will use their technology and restore the Earth to its original um, state. Okay? Some of that genocide was to be done by viruses. And as most of you know, the AIDS virus was created. And there are others that are coming, anthrax and, and uh, the bubonic plague. You know, all of these things are coming back new and improved, I'm afraid to say, because there's some really, truly crazy people that are in positions of power on our planet. Many of them um, go back and forth from our planet to the moon. Now, <laughs> you don't have to buy any of this, and that's okay, you know. But I can tell you this, in the next 10 years, you will absolutely know for a fact. Richard Hoagland will be vindicated. He truly will. Okay? There are ruins on almost all of the planets in our solar system. There is life as we speak on Uranus right now. There's life, plant life and mammal life as we speak. Okay? It's there. If you want to do something to burst everybody's bubble, you know, get them to send a satellite there. You know, and if you have any connections, get them to keep the cameras rolling as it enters the enters the atmosphere. Anyway, <laughs> um, I want to talk about genetics. Uh, I'm going to read to you something that was given to me on 8-6 of 96. Actually, it was given to me a little bit sooner than that, and it took me quite a while to get it to Val. Um, and it's about genetics. It's, it's not very long, and, and I just ask that you, you bear with me. But apparently we were all copper-based. All of our, our physiology was based on copper. We were all blue bloods, okay? We were all royalty. In fact, we still are. It's just that our physiology is not working the same. And the reason it isn't is apparently because of a nuclear war that occurred here, one of the nuclear wars that occurred here. Now, why Earth? Well, number one, it's a really beautiful place, okay? It's not the only planet that has water. And when you, and when you listen to 
the scientists talking about you know, the different moons that have water on them, you've got to ask yourself this, where did the water come from? If you have a moon that has no atmosphere, how did the water get there? Because it wasn't always there. It wasn't always like that. It had atmosphere. They were moved. Even Earth was moved from its rotation twice. And there's a possibility, if it's able to happen, and I talked with this to Jay, with Jay-Z, that they want to do it again. The flood of Noah, okay, <laughs> was a moving of the planet from its original orbit. That's what caused it. Okay, we're talking about huge motherships that just tag on, hook a little, little chain to the planet and just move it. <laughs> okay, they have this technology. But that's what it is. It's technology. Okay, apparently we can do these things with our own minds if we're disciplined enough and we're clearly focused on our intent. And um, with talking with Jay-Z, that is exactly what Ramtha apparently has been teaching you. Okay, to remember who we originally were before we fell into time and fell into physicality. So I will read this. In your linear time of third density measurement of 439,231 rotations ago, war on a grave scale occurred in your solar system. This aggression occurred against those on your worlds that included not only you Terrans, but also those of Nibiru. This invasion of your system by Orion was led by a queen named Suti. This war was destructive on many levels and frequencies of physicality. We will focus tonight on your Terran physical form. It matters little to those who hear you, Alex, who do not listen. Please share this regardless of any emotional return to you in challenge. When your science truly removes their bigotry, they will discover of the, wis the wisdom of it. The last grave conflict was very harmful to your physical form. Many weapons of destruction, many of atom splitting have been used, which means nuclear weapons. This is the reason for most of your Terran skin tones. We shall explain. Orion was and is most interested in the females of your race because of the procreation, reproductive, and genetic strengths. We want to share the fact that much of your Terran history has been misleading in its truth by those who eventually conquered in control of your solar system. Nibiru won, but only a short battle, before they and other outposts were forced to leave your solar system because of genetic damage. Your original races were green-skinned. Those, this we know, because of large copper traces in your Terran 22 blood types. Also, the pituitary and thyroid were fully functional. The genetic damage to these organs was caused by radioactivity in air and all things of contact. The air was like this for a long time. It caused the genetic memory of these organs to be closed and almost atrophied. Your world experienced drastic changes in climate and massive magnetic fluctuations. Your different skin tones, spraces, are a result of an edema damage to your blood. It was then necessary for survival to create self-sufficient and contained environmental habitats, both above and below the Earth. Now, folks, this is what the Garden of Eden was. It was an artificially created environmental habitat. Okay, it's like you take, like what Richard Hoagland's been talking about. You know, you take a dome city, you build this dome, and then you terraform it underneath it. It's exactly what these were. Um, let's see, where was I? Much of the fossilization of your Terran remnants is caused by this radiation of your planet. Your system contained three suns at the time. Only two remain. <laughs> I'll read that again. <laughs> Your system contained three suns at the time. Only two remain. 
Write it down, write it down, it's a question. Your physicality, <laughs> your physicality in its original form contained a great balance of zinc, copper, magnesium, and iron. Your true blood color was green, like your chlorophyll. Some we have discovered even had a gold tint in it. At such, your physicality could survive in a high carbon dioxide atmosphere. Because of this, because of your, because of the skin color, the only stars in your system that affected your physical form were in the color spectrum of orange red, blue, and green. Now think about that. Okay? If you picture in your mind everything's a holograph, okay, which is a free, which is a group of frequencies. Because of this skin color green, the only stars in your system that affected your physical form were in the color spectrum of orange, red, blue, and green. Many of your Terran races were stranded on the surface. The genetic changes were the result of radiation damage. Your race went from green to red to yellow to black to white. Let's run this again. <laughs> your skin, your race, skin color went from green to red. It's the Native Americans, the Egyptians, and the Mayans. To yellow, which are Eurasians. To black, which are Afro Afro uh, African and Afro-Americans. To white. Your white races were then considered to be genetically the weakest. <laughs> Puts a whole new light on uh, prejudices, doesn't it? <laughs> I know the Nazis aren't happy about this. <laughs> it's just as well I don't like them anyway. <laughs> Um, as such, the survivors and descendants of the war were genetically altered and became white through edema. And they were persecuted and forced to live underground only to surface 5,508 rotations ago to the surface of your world. Now there's, somebody had read this and they sent me an email and they, they had said, uh, that I don't know somewhere that there's a legend that the white race appeared out of the mountains of Tibet some time ago, and I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, I'll ask uh, the Living Encyclopedia Val. He knows. <laughs> um, let's see. The Copper Bloodline is now a small race on your planet, but it is it is strongest genetically. Your native Red Nation race is very strong and easiest to discover and understand. And folks, this might understand, this might explain why there are so many abductions of the Native Americans on the reservations. And why even today they're still being persecuted. You know, because if you're a coward, you suppress the strongest. And of course, you know, many of us don't do much about it. You know, I don't want to get involved. You know, that's their problem, that's their issue. You know, we owe it to them. We owe it to ourselves. Um, let's see, the red is the closest to your original form among you. Your physicality had a natural defense to positive and negative frequencies due to the copper mineral in your blood. This lack of copper in your blood now has caused a partial loss of brain capacity and nervous system. Remember, your DNA contains cellular memory. It is possible to unlock this memory with the use of minerals such as copper. Your blood systems adapted to iron because of copper depletion due to radiation. We will share more with you, but we must return now. Be at one. They always end it with be at one. 
Okay. Uh, just keep going. <laughs> um, are there any questions? <laughs> I don't want to bore you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> You guys are so great. I'd take you all home, but I can't feed you. <laughs> uh, hey, I have, a, I, have, I have a family at home, and a new family, actually. Uh, my wife and I just had a baby. He's a month old today. Thank you. He's totally cool. <laughs> He's taught me three things already. <laughs> Patience, tolerance, and insomnia. <laughs> he doesn't like to sleep. I, I don't know. Most kids, are, I was told, do. And he likes to be up every hour and a half. My poor wife, she went from needing nine hours of sleep a night. She's only getting 90 minutes. I don't know how she does it. You mothers must know. <laughs> wow. What a club, huh? It's an elite club, I'll tell you. When I saw the baby come out, I was like, oh, God, I'm so glad I'm a man. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, I said it was like passing a watermelon, and I can't imagine what that's like. <laughs> oh. Oh. Nor do I want to know. <laughs> Oh, um, <laughs> let's see, um, I've talked with Mornane Faseus about um, maturity and a lot of this had to deal with me specifically about how to grow and you know there and when this first started they, they didn't tell me that I would, would be speaking or would be required to speak. And that's because I didn't read the fine print on the contract. <laughs> uh, and you got to read the fine print, folks. <laughs> okay? Do yourself a favor. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to read to you the stages that they, um, they said that the human being goes through. And I don't this is not just us. There are human beings everywhere. Not only on our plane of physicality, but on other planes. And I want you to know that even though uh, you may not see them, even though you know you talk about the, well, what I refer to as dimensions or densities, um, what apparently uh, Ramtha refers to as the planes, there is a physicality on every one of those planes or densities. Okay, it's not, they're just whispering little clouds and there's a light breeze and if you're lucky one will blow through you and oh hi, how are you? That's not what it is, okay? <laughs> it's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, so these were the stages that a true human being goes through during its, his, his or her, its evolution. The first is the wandering where we come from, why, our purpose, and gathering our tools. The second is an initiation, preparing our own path, each one different, purifying, and hopefully centering. The next is honoring, understanding the source of our creation. That's a biggie. Recognizing the sacred in oneself. And I guess that's exactly what you're being taught here at the school, is how to recognize your sacredness. Stating intention, realizing and acknowledging one's true purpose to create self. Surrender, big issue with me. <laughs> Well, you know, we have, we have this concept of surrender as you just let, like, anything happen to you, and that's it's not really true. Letting go of control to allow vulnerability. To learn what is already known. 
I forgot. <laughs> Embrace our own darkness. Walking into the unknown parts of self, being and becoming the void. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that after I go through it the first time. Lighting the flame in the heart, connecting to self and finding meaningful, honest ritual. Transformation, climbing the ladder of self-responsibility to hold a vision of being oneness, being the vision that alters all perception. Becoming human, empathy and compassion toward all, being in truly responsible relationships. And folks, I've learned for me that that's the secret of life is relationships, because they all mirror back a part of us, part of me, all the relationships I have. Um, walking the path, integrating all of life's experiences, being a teacher by being. Service, discarding the illusion of separateness, total approach to life in humility and joy, and the last, the worship of the isness is the creation of self. The isness is their concept of creator, creation, what we refer to as God. I don't like to use the connotation God much anymore because, you know, our perception of it here, you know, is based on biblical teachings. And those beings, the God in the Old Testament and the God in the New Testament, are extraterrestrials. They're not the big guy. Okay. <clears throat> the big gal. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions now? Okay. <laughs> Let me get some water. Um, fear is a big issue, at least not in this room, but outside this room it is. <laughs> it is with me on bad days, you know. <laughs> um, so I would like to share with you their perspective of fear and trying to understand it. In your time and space at present is a great challenge to you all. That would be the expression of fear. For any of you to be in fear is to lack clear understanding of most situations. We have observed on your world, we have observed that your world is at a most confused point in your history and evolvement. We understand your remarkable drive and commitment to be alive, survival. We however are not understanding of your need to create tools of death, expecting they will keep all in a space of understanding and peace. <laughs> That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> we have observed that you build, create, and plan in a space of fear, not in the consciousness of love. So your defensive position of institutions that create and employ are always then in a state of unraveling and disintegration. We share this with you because they drain you and your earth of energy both the spiritual and materially physical. Fear always has to feed. Fear does not create itself. It has to feed. The fear we observe is difficult for us to understand. These are the Andromedans. It depletes you of your focus on the original intent. Now they've referred to this a lot. And they've never come right out and said what the original intent was but I suspect it's that definition I read you in the very beginning, that that was our original intent. It is elusive. It's a very secretive energy. Fear withholds love. This is most saddening to see and feel. 
How can we share understanding and love when so many of you are withholding from self and each other? You guys need some viral defense or something? Okay, please try to feel the words. We as a race are trying to express to your race. One of your original intentions in creating your physical reality is the idea of creating and learning to manipulate and express yourselves through physicality using your consciousness. Okay, that's, it is your consciousness that is the gift of the isness that the isness has given you and in fact all things that bear spirit. It is the gift that has been clouded and most importantly clouded by fear. This creation of fear is completely irrational to whom you all are. Fear, as we ourselves at one time as Lyran ancestors, sought to defend and legitimize withholding of love. We have come to understand that withholding love only creates perpetual disintegration. We have discovered in our home galaxy the ruins of vast races having achieved recognition that have ceased to exist. They destroyed themselves simply because they withheld love and drained the very life force out of their intent and imploded and destroyed their self-creation. Fear is the opposing projection to original intent. The first projection of fear is denial. <laughs> An emotion of incredible restriction. And as a restriction, denial and fear will result in the complete opposite reality as that which it claims to be. Fear is based in our perspective on a misunderstanding of one's own worth and security. Why is this so? We have formed a perspective based on your history. Your many religions have helped and hurt this process. Some of your world beliefs have many convinced they are sinful creatures of nature. Now I just want to add something here. In one of my conversations with Mornay, the word sin came up, and I brought it up. I was born and raised a Catholic, so I was fully uh, indoctrinated. <laughs> and um, he told me that the word sin is a word that comes that is pre-Sumerian. And the word sin originally meant genetic defect. So maybe that'll help you with a perspective when you read the Bible again, if you should read it again. <laughs> Some of your world beliefs have many convinced they are sinful creatures of nature. Your sciences teach that your physical form is a pool of chemicals thrown together by accident so that you are all an accident. <laughs> Living meaningless lives of chance. And folks, the first group of ETs that get here who are not going to benevolent and they're going to pass themselves off that they are, are going to be telling you that. That basically that, that you, that we are, a, are their creation, that they own us because they created us. And the fact of the matter is they didn't. Okay, it's, it's another lie. And the first group will probably be those from Cirrus B that will be openly contacting us. They're full of shit. Okay. <laughs> you know, the game continues, and uh, a lot of people are going to fall for it because the earth will be going through changes, and they'll come down and we'll save you, and, you know, this is the way, and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, basically what they're going to do is they're going to use our free will against ourselves because that's what you have, that's all you have, is your free will. It's the only true sovereignty you have in this menagerie of a holograph which we call existence. Okay, you are because you wanted to be. It's that simple. 
And if you don't want to be, then you can change that too. But it's your decision. Okay, it continues. I'm sorry. Um, you fear a God whom a book says is a loving, forgiving God who will eternally throw you into an abyss for making mistakes. <laughs> it creates serious dysfunction, don't you think? <laughs> Which way do I go? <laughs> and you do nothing, you know? It is in our perspective where this fear of unworthiness and insecurity is created from. Many in your world, Alex, have come to understand that fear, the idea of fear, is their enemy. And all of you struggle between understanding and fear and reason and fear. Please, we ask you to share this with your race. This struggle is in no way predetermined. And our perception is that this struggle will lead your world to peace and self-responsibility or your extinction as a race. This would grieve us. It's time to return you now. And I was given that on 2 9 of 91. <clears throat> so, in dealing with the reflections that Moronet and Phaseus have given me. Um, about our race. It, it's been difficult to want to come back, especially when I've seen how they, they treat each other. The very first time I was taken on board a, an Andromedan mothership, I have actually spent three months with them. I lived with them for three months in 1986. But when you when you, and, but in our linear time, I was only gone 18 minutes. Time travel is a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was home to make car payments and everything else. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> oh, okay. How they treat each other. Anyway, the first time I was brought on um, on an Andromedan mothership, and they are 900 miles in diameter. Okay. They are completely self-contained worlds. Everything they need is there. I had to wear a belt so that it would keep my physicality together, so that I could spend this time with them. With the very first time I, I walked on, and in the middle of, they're made up of different levels. The craft I was on had 24 different levels. And um, in the middle of these craft, there is a 21 mile by 21 mile park with trees and everything, okay? and they use extensive technology and holographs. And they can literally create their sunrise, their sunset. Okay, and, you, and, and the trees and plants grow because it is a holograph, but it is real, even though they're creating it with technology. The very first time I walked on, there were children. They teach their children in the middle of these parks. Everything's done in nature, like very much like the Native Americans used to do, you know, when the teepee got too small. And I walked on, and there were a bunch of children there, and as we walked out of a corridor, down a corridor, and out into this huge space of what looked like, could be anywhere, like a Gura Hills or someplace out here, a park, the children moved away from me. And I was like really hurt, you know, I was like, oh man. And Moronet immediately picked up what I was feeling, and he said, it isn't you, we have been teaching them about your race. <laughs> it's really not all that funny. <laughs> okay, um, they were afraid of us. You know, and these are children I have never seen before, but immediately felt 
our energy, my energy, because I represented all of us. You know, and I do the best I can, sorry. I mean, <laughs> but you know, I got my own stuff to work out too. So, you know, they're learning, and, and, and I'm, I'm amazed that they, you know, they still want to come back and, and help. Another time I had been um, waiting for them, they finally showed up, and as I was walking into the control room, I was being led by another Andromedan. Uh, Morinet was looking at a bunch of meters on the wall and some monitors measuring our atmosphere. And he looked really sad. So I said to him, I said, what's the matter? And he just pointed to the atmosphere and he goes, don't they understand that it's here because they needed it? They don't understand our suicidal tendencies. They, they don't. Uh, I guess they have the perspective that we should really know better. I don't know where they got that. Um, so, I mean, that's just one of them, you know. Um, uh, another time, Vis Viseus was watching television on the ship. They were picking up television. And I told them that's not a good idea. <laughs> Even on Earth, that's not a good idea. <laughs> and um, he had been watching a news broadcast about um, about a shooting in Chicago, that's what it was, where a cop shot a, pol uh, a, cop shot a, a man, a black man, and then rushed over and tried to save his life. He had a hard time understanding why the policeman would try to take the life and then try to save it. He, he didn't understand the contradiction, and I don't know that they've still clearly dealt with that. Um, you know, our, our reality that we know, that we accept as reality, is extremely foreign to a lot of other different races. They simply don't understand it, and there's like no way we could really truly rationalize it to them when they truly come from a space of unconditional love or mutual respect. Um, and I have not done a good job in explaining it to them. Because when I really stopped to think about it, it didn't make any sense to me at all, either. Um, so as Val would say, it's time for a new paradigm. And I guess that's what Ramtha is doing, teaching all of you and, and those before you and those to come after you. Um, I've given a lot of thought to our race and the character issues. And I just want to share with you some of my thoughts on the human race and about people. A lot of this comes from my own experience dealing with us. A human being whose heart shows no passion is a person who doesn't have a life. A human being who doesn't give from his heart or her heart is a person who will lie to you. I've had to learn that the hard way. A human being whose heart is committed to nothing is a person who will not try, who will only take. A human being who is not willing to risk or take chances for love is a person who is absolutely empty inside. They're already dead. They're just sucking up air. I've, I've come to this conclusion because of my relationship with Morinay and Viseas. I absolutely love these two beings. They are my fathers, my brothers, my friends. Um, and, you know, in some respect, even my sons, because I've had the opportunity to, to teach them. You know, and even English, it was like, you know, I felt like I was a really big deal, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's so much information out there that is totally bogus. I went to the Star Visions conference. I'll probably get into trouble because this is beyond video, but I'm not going to do any more anyway. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't pull any punches. I really don't. I mean, what the hell? Life's too short, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this incarnation. <laughs> Okay, we have a difference of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
hey, you know, I've been hanging out with those guys, and, you know, they live thousands of years. I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> but I don't want to live a thousand years here. <laughs> Not the way it is. <laughs> Okay, where was I? <laughs> Star visions, thank you. See, it's the insomnias, little munchkins around 3.30. Somebody wrote in a card we got, up around midnight, when you hear that mournful cry, just remember at 3 a.m., you can give it another try. <laughs> and it's so true. The Star visions, there was a guy there who had some pictures of some craft and he said that uh, he has been in contact with Syrians and he mentioned Cirrus B and uh, he, then he went on to make a speech and uh, Jesus Christ is a starship commander he lives on earth underground in a place called Valley of the Echoes and that they're coming back and there will be a war and those who are not in favor of Jesus will be destroyed <clears throat> And they gave this guy a standing ovation. I'm not kidding. They gave this guy a standing ovation. And um, it was really sad because these people don't have a clue. They don't want to take responsibility. You know, they can totally thwart this war. We don't have to do anything really about this as long as we started working and learning to live with each other, granting mutual respect having natural tolerance for our race. And I know it's not easy because of all the conditioning. But folks, I need your help. I desperately need your help. You know, we don't need to create the book of Revelations, and that's exactly what we're doing. And there are beings out there that have technology that are more than happy to help us play this thing out because we are a threat to them. And the reason we're a threat is not only who you are spiritually, which I will get into, but it's also because of our genetics, okay? They, our physicality was the Earth, phys, uh, the Terran physicality, which is what we're known as, was melded between human extraterrestrial and the primate race, as this is what I've been taught. And it is that melding of those two races which gave us our incredible extremes of emotion which is why we can hold so much creative energy inside of us. This is why they're concerned, and this is why the Andromedans are in awe of our creative energy. Because here they have to use technology to create some of their physicality. We don't. They're amazed that when you leave your house, okay, when you leave your house, everything is still there when you come back. It doesn't disintegrate. <laughs> now, if you live in South LA, well, then you gotta worry about your stuff being there. <laughs> They're amazed at that, of the intent and the energy that it creates to create every one of those little tchotchkes that you have on your shelf. <clears throat> they're amazed. Because they're, they're very simple. They're very, very simple. They don't have all the little stuff that we have. <laughs> <clears throat> According to the Andromedans, what they have been able to discover, and apparently other races also have discovered this, is that they say that in our, what we know is our, holo our universe, which is a holograph, that there are 11 layers. I'll just deal with this. 11 densities, and now apparently there is a 12th. This is their perspective, okay? And they say that we fell into time into physicality. They say, the Andromedans say, that many of the extra, other extraterrestrial races 
are fascinated by what it is we know that we have locked up inside of us. Because we have already evolved to that level and then have come back to start all over again. They don't have access to this. What they think we know, what apparently is locked up inside of us. Not only that, but apparently we specifically chose this physicality because of the vibration that we held because of the primate and human because the physicality was able to hold such an extreme of emotions that we chose this physicality. And when you couple that with the idea that this physicality is also made up of 22 races, one of which includes the Andromedan race, they say we're royalty. They say that every single one of you is royalty on this planet. that you are royalty and that many of the other extraterrestrial races, particularly the benevolent ones, acknowledge this because of the fact that we are spirit and we have these genetics inside of us. The, the, the dark ones, which include the gray men and others, they see us as beasts because of the primate. How can we allow this to surpass us? And this is why the constant genetic and mental manipulation. And in talking with Jay-Z, you know, like she was saying earlier, we both, we, we talk different ways, but we're really, in many respects, saying the same thing. They're concerned that once we move out of our prison of third density, that we will radically change everything. I don't know about you, but I need a change. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so burned out. <laughs> I want to go home. Um, the Andromedans told me that the reason that I am one of four contactees, um, apparently there will be more added in the very near future, and I hope that some of that has to do with my griping. Um, <laughs> I have, I've bitched and moaned and everything else. <laughs> it's just, it's just impossible, you know, there's just not enough people. Um, that there will be more, and those that will be contacted, you, the reason I and the other three were chosen, I guess, in the first round um, is because that apparently when they were here, they had a colony 62,300 years ago. It's an approximation. Um, they were here for only 65 years that I was one of them that was here. That's how I got here. Okay? And there was a battle, and they were chased out of here. And um, I was killed in that. So, uh, you know, when I, when I write this number on the board, 62,000, that's a long, that's a large number to me, you know, and uh, I know it's linear time and I know it feels like it was just yesterday, um, but I know that I, I'm from another place and all of you are, you know, your souls were not born and hatched here. I can tell you that we've all come from someplace else. Um, they say that our universe, what we know is our universe, if we were to put it in our linear time, is a 21 trillion year old holograph. They also say that there are a hundred trillion galaxies total in this, which we call our universe. That's including the other dimensions. A hundred trillion. And some people still don't think there's life out there. <laughs> I don't know what to do with folks like that, you know? I have some really good friends that I work with that are, you know, very, very good people. They're very awesome people, um, have full of integrity. 
um, but they are convinced that there's going to be a rapture and they don't have to do anything but just wait. And God, that pisses me off. <laughs> I mean, there's so much work to do and you're just going to sit on your butt and wait? Suppose he changes his mind, I said to one guy. <laughs> uh, he goes, oh, he, he couldn't do that. <laughs> I said, is he God? Well, yeah, well, then he could, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh god I'm so frustrated um, <laughs> I just you know I, I just I feel the pressure of of things starting to get tighter and smaller and uh, it's really great to see to see this um, I was very disillusioned last weekend and I had basically told my wife Carla I said that's it I'm fed up I've had it you know, I even thought about not coming because I was just so burned out. Well, you know, folks, it, you know, it isn't easy walking these two worlds, you know? <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I forgot who I was talking to. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> and, um, you know, there, was, there are times that I, when I, I go out for walks at night and, and I try to call them down and they don't always come. And, um, you know, I, I, I look at my son and I look at my wife and I'm like, you know, do I need to put all my energy into this? And can I do both or what? And there are times I truly wrestle with, you know, where it is I want to be. Because the two realities are so extreme. You know, I mean, when I go up with them, I am so free, I, I can't even put it into words. And when I come back here, it's just like, you know, there's the phone bill, the electric bill, the gas bill, the car payments, the insurance, baby diapers, you know, <laughs> formula, <laughs> goat's milk, uh, you know, <laughs> all these little things, you know. And I, and I say to myself, God, you know, they, they really got the right idea. They keep it real simple, you know. And all their energy goes into creating themselves. They're not distracted by all this other stuff. And um, I, I wrestle with that a lot. And I haven't come to a conclusion yet. I'll keep you posted. Um, Okay, I want to read you something else that uh, was from Phaseus. This was given on 6-5 of 96. The most necessary action now for all of you who are aware is to do what you are capable of to illuminate your degenerated societies. Consciousness is your scale. It always provides balance which does not fail. It speaks to those and tells them what to do and what not to do to one or all beings who choose to be evolved. The administrators of your governments are responsible for professional order, not your moral codes of order. The key to your happiness, Terrans, is in the hands of your own consciousness. We have perceived that you Terrans have arranged your lives not according to yourselves, but according to others. Your disappointments are due to this fact, this kind of conduct, this kind of conduct of yours is what is limiting your races. Each one of you is a free soul, a free consciousness. No one is the servant or slave of anyone else, though the hidden ones would trick you to believe otherwise. Mutual respect is imperative for a healed planetary race. Help is being extended to you if you so want it because of our genetic lineage to your races. We would like to be with you during your difficult times. And we are right on the edge of that. Today, you are a planet and a race that destroys itself in ignorance. Your goal is to uncover the genuine human beings lost deep within yourselves. Always be at one with yourself. And then he went on at another point and said, we have been in communication with many races in discussions regarding militant decision-making. 
We all agree that conflict in the end serves one purpose, to create fear. And this, we know, removes the original intent from creation. We are hopeful that sincerity will gain a momentum. Just because they have these really fancy ships and, uh, you know, all this other stuff, it doesn't mean that they're, you know, that they're great guys to go have a beer with. Okay? Um, I want to... I want to share some things with you that I've not talked about publicly. And um, there are things that are going on, there are abuses of the past that I want to share with you what Morinay and Phaseas have told me. For example, one of the biggest questions we've always had in America is what happened to John Kennedy? Okay. I know that that really bothered me, and I can remember sitting home watching the funeral on television. And you know, to this day, it is like it was yesterday, okay? I mean, you know, he, he was no saint, but still, he was better than a lot of them. According to the Andromedans, <laughs> God, do I want this on tape? Oh. <laughs> I just remembered. Some of the missing children have not only been taken by the Greys, by Orion, but also the Pleiadians. Now, apparently in the star, in the, in the systems near Aldebaran, there are human Terran colonies that the Pleiadians have taken children from here. When I asked Morinay if they had permission to do this, he said no, there were many broken hearts left behind. Okay, again, whatever the justification is, it's still a violation of free will. And that's how you have to measure somebody else's actions. Okay? Sirius has also been doing this. There are there were many children taken underground, not only by our government. Um, many of the children um, were, were, uh, were eaten. Okay? And I'm, I, I see a lot of heads shaking up and down. I just want you to know that the Andromedans confirm this as well. And ladies and gentlemen, they are our future. Whatever it's going to be, you know, they are our future. And you've got to protect your families. Okay, we, you, the family is the target. Because that will, that will pull the rug right out from underneath our society in a heartbeat. Because a lot of people find their strength, even if they're cowards, they find their strength in their families. When that doesn't exist, then we got big time problems. Children are leaving this planet a hundred, at least a hundred thousand a year. And you're not hearing about it. It's from all over the world. They're just being taken out of here. And the ETs feel, some of the ETs feel like they have a right to do it. And basically, it's, it's a deal that was cut with our world governments. Okay? I wanted to share that with you because it might help you when things totally start to unravel. And for those of you who are Americans, you know, you're about to witness the great implosion of the United States government starting this year, starting after April. Um, it's just going to start to unravel next year. Okay? The lies are going to start to come out. The truths are going to start to come out. And um, you're going to be blown away at how corrupt, how corrupt your government is. <laughs> okay, again, I forgot who I was talking to. You got to understand, I don't talk to an educated crowd like this, you know? Uh, this is really a treat for me. <laughs> I mean, you guys are just awesome, you know? <laughs> uh, 
Let's see. Um, I'm going to show you some Andromedan holographic language. Now, remember, this is only 3D. <laughs> if you can in your minds, you know, use your holographic technology that you're being taught and pull it off the board and be able to move all the way around it. Five minute break in 10 minutes? Well, do you want to at least stand up and stretch? Well, you're gonna. <laughs> I'm not an expert on how holographs work, but in this holograph, if you could see it physically, all the way around, contains information. This symbol, when given holographically to another race, totally tells them everything about the Andromedan race. And apparently we are supposed to do that, be able to do that, and apparently we already do, but we don't really understand how it works. Okay. This is the symbol for love or mutual respect. This is not a money sign. <laughs> Again, it's holographic. When they when they say this if, if they were able, if they were to project it inside of you, and you know our consciousness and our our, our, our both our hemispheres would totally under understand it. In this one symbol would be their entire concept and everything they know about mutual respect. See, it's simple. You know, it doesn't take 200 pages to explain love. It's just there. It is. This is Earth physicality. When they give this symbol, this symbol contains our entire Earth history. Again, you lift it off, okay, you're looking at it fourth dimensionally, fifth dimensionally, you're underneath it, above it, and inside is just contained information. Okay, can I erase this? This one? All right. Oh, oh. Thank you. <laughs> this is very cool. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> I mean, it's great to be able to do the job with all the tools, let me tell you. <laughs> That's a symbol for war or conflict. 
confrontation. Oh, God, the water's really good here. That's the fax number. <laughs> or the email. Oh, you guys can't see? I can't pull it off the board on wall. I'm sorry. Well, somebody else over here has it. They can share it with you. OK. Now, this is a much more complicated one. That's the symbol for the earth races. That's all of us, white, black, red, yellow, and green. Now this next one should be really interesting to you guys. I'll just put it right here. Now, those of you who are into astrology, um, this is very similar to the circle cross, which goes back to history. And uh, apparently that symbol is supposed to represent peace. Okay. How does it do that? I can't, I'm wired. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much for coming back. <laughs> That was really unfair. I know you're a captive audience. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> okay, a couple things that, um, that I was asked to go over again was the implosion of their density and what that really entails. And I know I kind of skimmed over it. So um, what I'm going to do is to share with you what I have been told. Now, some of you may understand the physics of this better than I do. Um, I'm just basically the messenger one of the messengers. Okay, according to the Andromedans, 21, whoops. Twenty-one trillion years ago, as we are in linear time, apparently all of us as essences as isness uh, as sparks of spirit or someplace else in a completely different reality and what they say happened was that the big bang theory is basically correct in its simplicity um, but the physical part that we know of was the last of the creations or realms created in what we call our universe. Okay, now when I'm referring to universe, I want you to know that I am talking about all of the 11 creational densities, or planes. That'll make it simpler for you. What they say happened was that all the black holes were created because wherever we were, that space, that universe, 
began to evolve. And as it evolved, those of us who weren't ready to evolve literally gained weight in, in mass. Okay? And in gaining weight, we started to fill black holes. And at some point, when this other universe evolved to a certain frequency, those of us that didn't literally broke out of those black holes and created this space which we call our universe. And what we're witnessing 21 trillion years later is the same thing happening. And what happens here is, what's happening now in our universe is that according to Moronet and Phaseus on March 23rd of 1994, a color and sound frequency started emanating out of all of the black holes. And it is, it, the color and sound literally in its unified effect is, atta is attaching to all of the densities or planes. What's happening is that it's raising all the frequencies. Everything is literally being pulled up from the bootstraps. It is literally creating a holograph over these 11 creational planes. They're calling this the 12th. And the reason they are is that it is unified, but yet it's separate. And that they have been told by other races that there are beings of consciousness never seen the likes of before inside this 12th and that they literally have the ability to look straight down through all the dimensional levels. What's happening is that third density is beginning to implode because as the frequency starts to rise of third density matter, those that choose to evolve, there are a greater number who are in fear and will not be making the same transition we will be. Now because we're spirit, the essence of us is spirit, nothing ever dies, literally nothing. So what is happening is that there are black holes being created as we speak. There are dips, literal dips in physicality being created where people will be gathering, souls will be gathering as they make their transition into these spaces so that they can continue to evolve by literally creating another space. Unfortunately, one of these areas is between us and the dog star Cirrus, which is why there's so much crap coming our way. Okay, you got a front row seat. <laughs> and all I can tell you is, you know, um, you know, bless them as they make their transition. Because um, we've been there before, all of us. And uh, I've been told on our planet that literally the probability is there will only be 400 million of us making this transition. You know, and... Um, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. You know, it would be nice if it was everybody. And um, when you get to fifth density, look for the house with the mailbox with the balloons. That's my house. <laughs> I'll have everything there, sandwiches, you just show up. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I'll have to get a job. <laughs> what was the other thing? Okay. Now, Going back to the genetics that I shared with you about us having the 22 different races 
and the primate race, and because of our apparent essences, where we've been on a spiritual level and then decided to come back and start this thing all over again, what's happening is we can apparently, uh, our DNA can vibrate because of our, our ability to hold the extremes of emotion inside of us. Our DNA can vibrate at such a frequency, a high frequency, we can hold so much energy that we can literally take our experiences from here and part of our physicality into the fifth plane, fifth density. Now, when this happens, we radically will change what they know. Okay, this is why when people say, well, geez, Alex, why don't they just intervene? You know, there's, there's more to that than you think because when they come down here and they co-mingle with us, it not only changes our reality, it changes their reality. And a little piece of us goes back with them. Now, if most of you, let's just for an example, we're safe, we're from Andromeda, okay? You all evolve, you all lift up, you all move into fifth density, and then you decide, I'm going home, and you're off. And we all march into Andromeda together. Their civilization, their reality will never be the same. And this is why many of the races, particularly the benevolence, are coming back because they want a heads up. They want to know what to expect. They want to know who we are. <laughs> Do you follow what I'm trying to say? Okay, now the negatives, they've got everything really nice where they live. You know, they got everything under control and they have their caste systems, all right? They don't want us walking in there. Let's say some of you are from Orion. They don't want you going in there and wreaking havoc. Start teaching them about free will, about freedom. They don't want that. Okay, just because they're at another level doesn't mean they're that all evolved. There's still crap there too, okay? And they have a vested interest in control systems, control factors, and they don't want anybody rocking the cart, especially a race that they consider to be beasts. You know, and what's really interesting is they created their own undoing. They really did, by tinkering and everything else. And all it would take would be one of you to go in there and change one of these systems. Just your frequency alone. So you truly are royalty. You know, you guys are just awesome. And the war is about that. The war that's coming is literally because there are benevolent races that want our experience. They want our DNA. They want our emotions. They want us to be teachers because many of the of the benevolent races have lost their passion folks they've lost their passion you know for the greys themselves they thought that emotion was a weakness so they literally bred it out and now they're dying okay they're dying and they're totally stuck on technology their children they they're having they're not having children anymore because there's no passion in the body. The spirit cannot attach to the physical form. And there are other races like this. There are other races, and I was told by Morinae that the, the Pleiadians in 982 years in our linear time would start showing genetic breakdown because of so much interbreeding within the one race. Okay, We offer a booster to that because we have their genetics you know, as well as others, but we also have the passion. You know, the ability to hold passion, which is an awesome creative force. So there are some that really want us to be there, and there are some that are terrified of us being there. And that's really what it's about. The effects of what's going on here between now and 2013 are long term. Apparently, Almost 400 years into our future, there's tyranny. 
So what happens here is a major consequence because of who we are. And whatever we do here on third density, moving into fifth density, we will literally change six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It'll have a domino effect all the way up because apparently that's where we originally came from before we moved into physicality here. So we have to be responsible. There's a much bigger agenda here in picture. And I'm sure that there's even more that I don't know that maybe another contactee in the future or somebody else has already said. You know, you have to be private investigators. You've got to be detectives. And I know that there's so much information out there and so much junk and there's so much great stuff out there but you're literally going to have to weed it through yourselves. No one has all the answers. No one. There might be some that have more of the pieces of the puzzle. But the bottom line is, every single one of you in this room, even the, the people outside the room who aren't here sharing this, who have no clue, who still think ET is a joke, they have a piece of the puzzle. They just may not be able to bring their piece to the puzzle when we move into fifth density or plane. Um, okay. <laughs> What's going to happen in the 10 years, next 10 years? I have no clue. <laughs> hey, that's a pretty good cop out. I... <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're gonna be busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it's in this pile. The reason I'm going through this is so I want to make sure I get it right. A lot is going to happen in the next 10 years. <laughs> I'm sorry, I needed a thicker folder. Anyway, uh, okay. Alex, it's me. <laughs> I thought it was God. <laughs> I'm not building an ark. <laughs> Uh, you can just forget it. All right. When does the okay. when is the uh, collapse, the dimensional collapse, starting? Is it already starting? It's already started. With the sound uh, and the color. Okay. It's already it's already started. Thank you for leading me here. Um, what you're going to start hearing about in the ne next near in the very near future are something called rods, and they will be something that will be videotaped. Um, and what they will be, what you will see are large streaks just shooting through the air that are etheric, but are being able to be captured on tape. And what you're seeing is literally fourth and fifth dimensional craft moving through space, not having the slightest clue that they're flying right through us. Okay? And that's because you're beginning to see the implosion. <laughs> it's great stuff. Um, and ghosts? <laughs> yes, you will see more ghosts, more apparitions, because those that are stuck between third and fourth density will start being more and more visible as our frequency starts to raise and rise. Um, a lot of them, unless they are healed, and I do not know how to do that, how to set them free from their self-imposed prisons, um, will be exiting, transitioning. Um, angels, folks, be very careful. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
about somebody who tells you they're an angel. For example, um, I've asked about the archangels. And the Andromedan perspective of that is, is that the archangel Michael was literally a fleet of craft that were called Mikael. That was the name of the fleet. And they used to patrol the northern hemisphere of the planet when Orion was here in full force. Gabriel was the name of another fleet of craft, and so on and so forth. It has been changed and created into something that will save you and rescue you, when in fact, that was not the original intent at all. Okay. Uh, what's going to happen in the next 10 years? Um, I, I will share this with you. Um, there are definitely some things underneath the Sphinx, but the bulk of the real stuff that will tell us about our ancient history is still underneath the pyramid. And there, are, there, were a, there was a vault built three levels deep, and the pyramid was built over it. Okay, that's where the real juice is. That's where the real knowledge is. Um, the Sphinx will have some things, but it's a distraction. You know, these guys are real good at what they do, at diverting attention from reality, from truth. They're excellent at it. If they put that much energy into telling the truth, God, we'd all be out of here, you know? Um, Okay, hold on one sec. I'm just, I don't have it it's somewhere. Okay, things that are going to happen in the next 10 years. Number one, we're going to truly find out who we are genetically. Um, information will be coming from all corners of the earth from contactees. There will be more and more contacts, and they will tell us about the 22 different races and more of our history. There will also be massive earth changes. They will start with a magnetic pole shift, which could happen any time between now and the year 2001. Things have been sped up. Um, we're already starting to see the magnetic pole shift as we see birds migrate in the wrong direction at the wrong times of year. The birds move along the Earth's magnetic grid lines. And I wanted to share something with you. I'm very fascinated with the Native Americans. And uh, I love to collect feathers when I find them on my, on my journeys and my uh, vision quests. And I was given this on 319 of 94. And I just want to share this with you. It's primarily about the Native Americans and the original intent behind them wearing the feather. In the ancient way, your native red American races understood the nature of the birds. They, the, the birds are very sensitive to magnetic fields and microwave energy, as you call it. They will migrate along the Earth energy grids, and their wings, which are made up primarily of feathers, were to be watched as they were very sensitive. To watch and follow the birds is to know which way the Earth's magnetic flows are moving. They would also, the Native American races, camp off these magnetic flows because the radiation would become harmful in time. The feathers are very sensitive to energy fields and magnetic fields. They are, in fact, an antenna. The feather would attract telepathic communication with all the tribe. As the chief would think or quietly discuss plans, the rest of the tribe would, in the ancient days, receive the message with few or no words. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Ask my wife if I should wear a feather in my hair. She says, nah. <laughs> um, now, what's really interesting is that most of our cities are built on the magnetic grids. <laughs> When, you know, there's a lot of folks sick in the inner city. There's a lot of turmoil in the inner cities, okay? Because uh, we're not in balance. And of course, we persecuted the Indians. Um, 
because their knowledge was different than ours. Okay. Um, the quiet science of archaeology has and will discover more and more of our ancient history, including extraterrestrial civilizations. There is going to be the acknowledgement of a temple complex that belonged to Lemuria that is apparently still intact, lying approximately 150 miles southwest of Easter Island. I'm told it's huge. I've also been told the Russians already know it's there. They have photographed it and explored it in many submarines. Um, we are going to discover that consciousness, I know you guys already know this, <laughs> but for those who aren't here, we are going to discover that consciousness is not in the brain, but is located in its entirety in the energy field and or aura. And that energy field is the four to 14 ounces the body loses at the moment of death. Okay, I know you guys know that. <laughs> uh, let's see. UFOs, okay, apparently, there have been discussions amongst benevolent councils, and I will only speak for the Andromeda Council because that's what Morinet has told me, that they have told all of the negative extraterrestrials in and or on our planet and on the moon to be out of here no later than August 12th, the year 2003. I've also been told that there's a very high probability that you, we could wake up some morning in that area of time and our moon will not be here. That is because it is the first stage of defense. And they will literally hit it with a tractor beam and pull it away from us if they're gonna do battle. Because if they were to attack it to get in here for whatever reason and it were to explode, everything would be for naught. Now when I, when I uh, first talked about this, there were some people that were very upset. Well, geez, what about the ocean and the waves and my moon cycle and all this other stuff? <laughs> 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 so I went back to Mornay and I says, you know, hey, I've, I've got, you know, some gripes about the moon <laughs> disappearing. And he says, well, we'll just get you another one. <laughs> and I says, you'll make sure it won't be hollow, right? He says, yes. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> Apparently, all that would really happen would be that the oceans uh, would become lakes. We wouldn't have the tides, and we probably wouldn't have the, the crazy attitudes and such like that. Um, I've asked them about astrology, and I want you to know this is their perspective. Okay? Does everybody hear what I just said? Okay. <laughs> their perspective is, is that it's not accurate that the purpose for charting the stars, what originally we were taught and left with, was because they needed to know the magnetic flows of the stars and the systems for space travel. And that somehow we have taken that and made an entirely new, different belief system out of that knowledge. You knew that. Maybe I should sit out here. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> it's an option, huh? <laughs> uh. But you guys are so far from Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, let's do some questions. Let's do some questions. Yes. Alex, <laughs> why are the Andromedans and the council, which I thought was intriguing, the council that met, why did they decide to give the ultimatum to all the ETs that are in the earth and on the earth and above the earth at a specific time? And I think it's also of interest that some of the council rebelled and didn't want to send anything into here. 
<laughs> so why, okay, Alex, why, what's going to happen when everything's turned off? <laughs> no, I have a good memory, Alex. And then, uh, <laughs> number two, I forgot number two, great memory. Um, well, let me answer the first one. Some memory. No, okay. Uh, let, oh, let me that, answer the first Alex, one. That. Let me answer the first one. Okay. Apparently, the reason why they want to help and so many others want to help is because in your genetics, you have a frequency that is attached to different races. Okay? I have a frequency that is attached to Andromeda. And what happens is they, as a race, just because I may move into another space in time or holograph, there is a part of me that is still attached to them. Okay? And there is a degree of non-evolution because, because of the law of consistency, we all don't move together. At some point, whenever that is, our entire universe, including all of the dimensions or planes, will implode and we will all go home to the source. Okay, this is one of the reasons why. The other reason, of course, is what I stated earlier, is because of our genetics. They want us to help them. We have something they need as well. Now, apparently when they first met to discuss our solar system, which is in a particular sector, which is along a, travel, a trade route, which moves into the Andromedan galaxy, and others, galaxies. Um, there were approximately 72 of the 130, 133 originally that met. Of the, 107, of the 72, just more than half agreed to look into it and to help us. The other planetary races didn't want to help us, and this was their reason why. They don't respect their home, they don't respect themselves, and they don't respect each other. What is their value? I cried. I cried that night when I heard this. Uh, because, you know, I couldn't make an excuse. I mean, this is how a bunch of other races look at us. You know? <laughs> Fortunately, a majority decide, had agreed to help because of the consequences long term. Um, and basically, that's, that's why they're here. That's one of the reasons why they're here. Um, also, in our future, 400 years into our linear future, there is tyranny in our galaxy. And somehow, we are directly connected to that event or events. So, in one way, they're really looking out for their own best interests by making sure that something is cleaned up here, that, you know, that something comes into balance. And they know that as long as the other ETs that are here, the extraterrestrial races that are here, and are manipulating, we won't move. So they have to be removed. And I asked, would you do it by force? And he said, we would have to. And what they would do is they would enter the poles and then flush everybody out to the surface. <laughs> so folks, when you see a reptilian crossing the highway, don't run over them, just get out of the way. <laughs> okay? I mean, it could get really, really weird here in the next six, eight years. I mean, you know, you can only hide a truth for so long and then it just screams out. And they're already trying to prepare you for this stuff. I have a lot of friends telling me about a, a TV show called Dark Skies, you know, where they're literally telling you, but they're doing it in, in a way that you think it's just, you know, television, you know? And I don't watch TV. We don't watch TV, so I miss a lot of good stuff, but, you know, I always hear about it. Um, and I think that was it. So now we can go to the questions. <laughs> Wait, wait, what? what? <laughs> okay, ma'am. 
Yes, um, hello. Uh, what I want to tell you and ask you uh, as a consequence is, are you familiar with a book called The Greatest Story Never Told by Lana Cantrell? It's a book about a thousand pages and she describes in her research that we did used to have a green skin and we were copper based and she also described all these color changes that we went through based on her research. Now this book is literally small print, thousand pages and I'm not through with it. But she also said the problems, describes the physiological problems that we have because of the lack of zinc, copper and what the iron is doing to us and what it did to us um, because our physiology changed our mentality and who we were narrowed totally. So you What's the question? confirm to me this. Okay. And my question is, did they tell you anything that we could do for ourselves to help ourselves to go back? That's one part. The other thing is um, the genetics, the DNA. We apparently used to have multi-strand DNA. Do you know anything about it? And um, do we need it? in our evolution. The third part is, <laughs> it's, um, did we used to have a whole brain that wasn't divided and do you know anything about that? Okay, thank you very much. I do not know about the whole brain part. Um, as far as the book, I've heard of it. I've had other people approach me, but I understand it's out of print and I understand that Ms. Cantrell does not return letters or anything. She's just basically in hiding for whatever her reasons are. Um, as far as the DNA, I have been told that those of us who are holding a higher frequency are literally creating a third strand. Most of the children coming in since 1982 already have a third strand. So this is just nature's way, this is the isness's way of just fixing things, as long as we're open to it. Okay. Okay, the question was, um, how can we help ourselves? I have asked that, and um, more and a, all he has said is, the information and wisdom already exists on your planet. So basically, you know, don't ask us about yourselves, ask yourself about yourself. <laughs> There's no shortcuts with them, I wish there were. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, it's great to see you here. Um, I want, wondered if you could talk more about the draconians and the children that are missing. I know you have information and I'm hoping you'll share it with us today. <laughs> this is the one subject I don't like to talk about. The Draconians, okay, the Draconians are a very large reptilian race, um, they're known as the Drax. There is a royal line of the Draconian reptilian race and they're called the Seacar. They range anywhere from 14, 15 to 22 feet tall. They can weigh up to 1800 pounds. They do have winged appendages and they are, they are awesome, awesome beings. Uh, they're extremely clairvoyant, they're extremely clever, and they can also be extremely sinister. They uh, uh, apparently were brought to our time and space, our universe, in full physicality. Somebody brought them here and dumped them here. I don't know, and the Andromedans still don't know. But they were brought here in physicality and they were taken to Alpha Draconis and stars nearby because it gave them the greatest chance of survival. So they were kicked out of some other place. Anyway, they are definitely a major factor to be reckoned with. Um, they, for, for the most part, are service to self. They do not care for the human race because when they were dumped here, they were told that this was theirs to command. So whoever did this really screwed up. And they still have this mindset. They were one of the first to chart our solar system. In fact, they were the first of the ET races to actually put their flag on it and say it's theirs. Apparently, they, some of them still have the attitude that everything on it, in it, still belongs to them. And um, I understand that some of them have been coming back 
and more will be coming back. Now, this, it's going to get real interesting, folks. I, I can't begin to tell you how interesting it's going to get. Um, they apparently were, they have had space travel for three billion years. They are, they are a remarkable race. They really are. But they have an attitude. <laughs> and um, a, lot of, a lot of human races in our galaxy and outside our galaxy have had problems with them. And, um, you know, I don't want to say that all of them are like that, but that's really all that I've heard from the Andromedans. They've had major problems, as all the other races have. Um, they are definitely reptilian. They look like uh, velociraptors, except they're like 22 feet. And they're smart, they're intelligent, they can build. Um, they're just very, very different from us. Uh, they apparently attacked Lyra or came across human colonies in Lyra. Now, the human race was not created in Lyra, okay? It was brought there to survive. And again, the Lyra, from what the Andromedans have told me, for some reason, once they go back approximately 427 million years, they just don't know what else is there. For some reason, there's no history beyond that, even though the physicality is there. So I don't know if it's being blocked from a higher level or what. They don't even know. Um, the Draconans were flying through there. They came across as human colonies who were, made, who were agricultural in nature. Um, basically, because of their talents of horticulture and, and uh, plant science, they were literally um, making the planets greater and better. Little gardens. When the Draconans flew by and they saw this incredible wealth of food, um, they basically wanted to control it. And apparently there was a misunderstanding between the lion races then, we were human, and the reptilian race because the Lyrans wanted to know more about the Draconians and the reptilian race before they gave them what they wanted. And apparently the uh, Draconians and uh, the Draconians misunderstood it and literally went back and then attacked. Attacked the planets and uh, killed a lot of people. Blew up three planets. And um, the Lyrans were literally forced to migrate and scatter into different parts of our galaxy. So it, it, it did, in a way, facilitate colonization. And I, you know, I, I wrestle with whether the, the Draconans were planted here specifically to force us to evolve, or if there's some other agenda here. I, I simply don't know that. Um, but that's basically what I know. I do know that not only them, but others other reptilian races that are descended from them. Um, also, the uh, uh, Draconans, the reptilian races, are master geneticists. And I'm told that most of the dinosaurs and um, uh, many other life forms that were on Earth were brought here um, then. Also on Mars, apparently Mars was very much like the Earth at one time. And they came to Mars first. That's literally where our human form was created, by the way, um, was on Mars. That's where the primate and the human genes were brought together, was on Mars. And then we were brought here to work as slaves in the mines. Okay? Um, so we're still working for a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, they... They, um, they enjoy human flesh and they enjoy children mostly for two reasons. One, they don't have the pollutants, the caffeine, the nicotine, and things of that, uh, all the processed foods that the adults have. And two, when they're put into a state of fear, their energy field and their adrenaline just explodes and they get a rush from it. You know, um, You know, be dedicated to family and be dedicated to each other, folks. That's the only way we're going to get through, through a lot of this, you know. Next question. You're welcome. 
Well, my adrenaline's rushing after that last statement. <laughs> Um, Alex, what is it precisely about the human mind that makes us so worthy to be feared and suppressed? What is it that's very unique to our 22 strand genetic makeup? And also, what is our free will compared with their free will? It seems to imply that do they have free will in the same way that we do? Okay, is that it? That's that question. The second thing is you haven't finished the earth changes yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for busting me. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> as far as our mind... Uh, I don't really know that it's so much the mind as it is, is our extremes of emotions, our essence. Um, they've always stressed not so much what's in the mind, even though that's important to be able to control the creative force of emotions. It's more so the emotions. Because, because we are able to contain all of that inside physical form, that's what they're most attracted to because they want that, because the races have lost, I've said this before, some of their passion, and they are becoming more and more dependent on technology. And here we are steeping ourselves deeper and deeper into physicality, when in fact we have the ability to just leave all this behind. So we are not correctly using our power as a race. In fact, we're wasting it. And uh, they're more attracted to that. And uh, I'll do the earth, the earth changes um, after we've gone through a lot more questions. Okay. Next. Thank you for your patience. We're not supposed to put many questions. I have more, but... Just one. I pick up just the most important for me. It's about implants, and if you know about specifically about the um, neutral implant by Cryon, about what? Cryon, the neutral implant. Do you know something? I know absolutely nothing about that. Okay. I'm sorry, but I do know a little bit about implants and um, getting getting back. This will work together. As far as our free will compared to others, other races' free will, they're really one and the same. It's just that we don't realize the power of our free will. We don't totally realize the sovereignty that our free will gives us. And that is why they are manipulating us through belief systems to try to get us to relinquish our free will by using our free will to say, okay, yes, you can come down and control us. Because then it's a choice. Okay? As far as the implants, what I do know is that there are a lot of races that have been abducting people and putting implants in them, and it is a sign or a seal of ownership. Okay? They feel that they own you. Now, the Greys have done this a lot because the United States government gave them permission to do it. You know, we were sold out, basically. Um, that's what I know. I do know that many of the implants can be neutralized using a very strong ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Gosh, you guys are getting crowded over there. I'm sure I speak for all of us. She mentioned earlier that this was a treat for you. It's very much a treat for us as well. Thank you. Okay, I have two questions that are relatively unrelated. The first one, if you get an opportunity later on uh, and have time, um, I would be very interested in hearing, but the second one is, is what I would like to ask you about. The first one is, you mentioned that the Andromedans know Rantha as the commander. Are there any other beings that they have mentioned, and does this in any way uh, tie in with why other races, along with the Andromedans, regard us as special? That's if you get an opportunity uh, later on. The second question that I want to ask you, 
is the Andromedans have mentioned several changes about to occur, what Jay-Z referred to. Sovereignty is a major concern for many of us. Many of these changes are going to represent um, financial opportunities as they unfold. I know that dates and specific levels or prices are, are mutable and subject to change, but have they given you any signposts or preliminary events to watch out for that indicate that change is imminent or about to happen? Thank you. Um. The earthquakes are changes, are, are signs. The volcanoes are signs. The, when you start to see large groups of people resigning from world government, that will be your biggest sign that shit's about to hit the fan. <clears throat> okay? Um, many of our world leaders have been, have been promised underground facilities and some even on the moon. And folks, there, is, there are bases on the moon that were built by the United States, Russians, and the British using British money. And I would suggest to you very, very strongly, you keep an eye on uh, Charles, Prince Charles. Okay? Just watch. No, uh-uh. Just watch. Then don't. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> um, when you spoke about the transition between going from fourth density to fifth density, how are we going to know that we made that transition? Um, okay, that, that's, that's an easy question. Okay, <laughs> we, we live in a color spectrum of 72 um, frequencies or 72 colors. When you get to fifth density, there are 223 different frequencies and colors. You will see colors you have never, ever seen before, and it'll be just like that. And you know you will be there. OK? Yes, sir? I mean, when McDonald's has purple arches, then you'll know. <laughs> Do the Andromedans have a military, and do they have a financial system, anything like ours? Okay, great question. No, they have no financial system. Everything that they create technologically is used for the advancement of their race. It is for educational purposes only, but it can be used in defense. No, they do not have an army or a military per se. They are scientists. What they do is they send their children to school from anywhere from 150 to 200 years. This is our time. Well, you know, they live 1,000 years, 1,500, 2,000 years. And what they do is they teach their students all of the arts and sciences. They are literally PhDs or masters in everything. Then at that point, they have the choice as to what it is they want to do. And they can change their minds in a heartbeat and do something else. So they are given all the tools. Everything is for education. Nothing is for distraction. Okay, they would never conceive of creating television as a distraction. Never. Okay, everything is to help them evolve. And their science and their technology can be used in defensive purposes, mostly the holographic stuff. Yes, sir. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on the uh, Dracos and, and Hale Bop a little bit. Um, all I've, all I've, all, what I have shared is really all that I know. Um, I just know that life is going to be very different. It is, they say it's a comet. It's not a comet. Um, I can tell you this, that it has split into two pieces, and both pieces are rotating, okay, around an invisible axis. They're rotating or like this as it's moving. And um, something that a friend told me that she heard on Art Bell, and I have not confirmed this, okay, so this is still rumor, but apparently an astronomer was on Art Bell, and he called and said that the, they have seen a large craft that is now flying alongside hale -Bob that's larger than the Earth, okay? So if it doesn't change course, it's going to be great. 
it's going to be great. All the denial is going to be gone. You know? Yes? Um, I understand the Andromedans have a version of the story of Enki and Enlil, and I'm wondering if you could tell us anything about that. Oh, that's a long question. Long answer. <laughs> um, actually, my understanding is that the um, that the the two brothers have really warred with each other over a lot of other issues. We just happen to be one of them. Um, I do know that um, Enki. What, what they've told me is that Enki was betrayed and killed and that his body is literally buried in the face that's on Mars. Now, whether he's reincarnated or not, again, I don't know. Um, but that's, that's all I know. Basically, what we have to deal with now is uh, Enlil. But uh, fortunately, you know, um, uh, truth is starting to come out about all that. And, and people are waking up and... Um, you know, realizing and seeing the contradictions in the Old Testament and um, even some of the contradictions in the New Testament. And they're starting to question, which is a very, very good sign. Um, you know, uh, Phaseus once said to me, it is not so important what you believe, but as, as to why you believe it. And whatever your belief is, make sure that it is worth the depth of your commitment to it. And, um, you know, I think what we've done as a race is we've accepted a lot of things just on face value without truly investigating it or trying to feel it inside of us. And it's gotten into us into a lot of, a lot of trouble. For example, the Inquisition. You know, the Inquisition was really, to, um, was really an attack against women. That's really what it was about, uh, about the sacredness, the Wicca um, of, of women and the science that, that they held, the spirituality that they held. Um, that's really what it was about. A lot of men got killed because they were supportive of the goddess worship. You know, um, you know, and that was a huge travesty uh, on the human race. Just one of many. Next question. This uh, scenario that you're uh, laying out before us is exists on this reality, on this parallel reality, or this timeline. Uh, what if the Andromedans say about parallel realities where this scenario doesn't happen? <laughs> He's not going to like my answer. <laughs> they haven't said anything. Um, I know that there are parallel realities, and I know that Earth, um, ha that several parallel realities of Earth um, are already in existence in the higher octaves above us. I know that in one of the realities, the New World Order is already established and exists. And, um, you know, the Nazi flag flies over the whole world. I want you to know that as we, as third density begins to implode, that all of those realities will be moving and merging into the one. Okay? Because the reality of which those two were created is the one we're on. And all the other ones will be returning to source. Now they've said that the New World Order will come into reality here, but for a short time as we keep moving. As long as we stick together, as long as we help one another, as long as we have mutual respect for each other, we will not slow down our process as we move up, you know, into the higher, higher dimension, um, or just to a higher consciousness of world unity of our free will, not being forced at the point of a gun to do it, or not having to relinquish your rights. You know, I mean, um, here in the United States, you know, a, a lot of people are worried about the Russians, they're worried about the Hong Kong police and the New World Order. Let me tell you something, folks. You're losing your country in the courtroom every day. It's in the courtroom with corrupt judges and institutionalized corruption. And I'll tell you what, if you allow, this is my own little political statement, if you allow the Congress and the President to take away the Second Amendment, you will lose all your other rights. 
I don't, I don't, I don't believe in toting a gun, carrying a gun, and, and killing anybody. All right? But the Founding Fathers knew about corruption, and they knew about tyranny. And the reason the Second Amendment is there is to protect all the other rights. And until we consciously make the shift and change everybody else's perspective, I'm afraid, from my perspective, it's a necessary evil. Um, but that's my perspective, okay? Um, you know, I, uh, I mean, we've, America, you have done so much in sh such a short amount of time. But you have to understand that when you're a draconian or Orion belief system, there is no such thing as free will, as self-rule in their control. And the reason we've been able to get away with it for so long is because, you know, when you look at where we are to the center of the galaxy, we're in the boonies. You know, we're way out here. And they're just now starting to come around and, and they realize that the magnetics of the planet, the consciousness of the planet, is starting to change. So they, you know, this is what is, has attracted a lot of the races to us now. It was also the blasting of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons not only affect third density, but they affect fourth and fifth. It sends a shock wave through it, okay? And we were totally irresponsible. We didn't know. We didn't know what we were doing, you know? And that's why a lot of the races started to show up. I mean, they'd have been here sooner, but that's when they really started to come in mass. Like, what the hell's going on down there? <laughs> you know? Next question. Again, I've only got pieces of the puzzle. Um, I've had a, a contact a number of years ago, and I know a lot of other people here have, and it was both um, very powerful and loving, and yet there was also some fear with that. Um, many of us are now thinking about how can we make contact that feels safe, evolving, loving. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Um, I'm asked this a lot, and all I can suggest to you is this. You can literally be and create anything you want. If you want contact, then what I would suggest you do, and this is really the only suggestion I have, is you create the space for it. Now, if you're very comfortable going into the woods, going on a walk and sitting on a rock someplace where you're totally isolated and you're there and you call them down and that works for you, that's fine. Okay, if you want them to come visit you at your home and you set up a specific time and you make tea and you wait for them to come. That's another thing you can do. It's entirely up to you, okay? But create the space. Show the intent to do it and be in integrity with it. In other words, for that hour or two hours that you decide to create the space, do it all the time. Make it always two hours. Make it always two and a half hours. Do it once every two weeks, whatever you want. Whatever, you, whatever ritual you want to make it in order to create the space, then that's what you do, okay? That's the only suggestion I have for you, wherever you went. Okay, next, please. On your tapes, you talk about um, how if we have 10% consensus on the planet, it'll be enough to move us through the transition. And you also give an exercise that they taught you about seeing yourself inside out. Yeah. And I, I'm interested in more information about both of those. And in this talk tonight, you've spoken about transfers, and I'm not sure what those are. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Transfers? When you first started speaking, Okay, well, let's go to your first question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was given an exercise. You, you guys probably all know this stuff already, you know. Um, but something that I was given specifically, which I do every day, and, um, you know, they never give me answers about myself. And it really pisses me off sometimes. Because, <laughs> you know, we're, you know we're, we're looking for shortcuts. I mean, let's face it, we're Earth humans. Okay. Um, anyway, the exercise was to get very, very quiet, get myself into a, a very uh, 
um, humbled space, sincere space is the word they use a lot. And it was literally to turn, grab my, my, the balls of my feet and turn myself inside out so that everything that's on the outside is now in and everything on the inside is now out. And when you see yourself upside down, you f see yourself strung out like this, very carefully detach yourself and look at who you are. <laughs> Don't get scared. Just, just work with it. <laughs> okay? I mean, that's, that's really the only exercise they've given me. Um, I've, I've had to, to develop my own things, and, um, you know, I'm still working with those. I'm still working with those. Um, you know, <laughs> next question. I'm fascinated. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Living your life where you're living it. Uh, I'm fascinated with the language of geometry that I'm learning is a comes from uh, deeper levels, and I'm wondering if you have or there are exact renditions of those symbols that could contain, for example, a pi ratio or a pi, or like I know the circles are could be exact and then they have a meaning. If they're a little off, they don't. It, do you know if there are exact um, symbols that could have like the five ratio in them, or is it, you just drew them like? Okay, okay. that's a great question. Um, I tell you what, I've I've never asked that question because it's always in my head. But what I will do is I will ask the specific dimensions and what tones and frequencies, and I will give them to Val Valerian so that he can put them on the web or get it to you guys. Okay, I will ask that. You've referred to the uh, Andromeda educational system and their feeling about uh, raising the children and putting the energy toward education. And you've made a few comments about uh, weapons in general, and I understand the First Amendment issue is a little different. We're heading into dangerous times, and mm -hmm. there's uh, a lot of controversy among different people in the school here about weapons and what should be done. Uh, the Andromeda feeling about mutual respect for everyone seems like a lot of the women that I know don't want to have anything to do with them no matter what, and a lot of the men I know are totally obsessed with them. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the Andromedans feeling of, of our weapons and the part that they would play in the changes that are going to be happening? Okay, it's a very good question. Oh, not an easy one. Um, they have said that we, and I, I said this earlier, that we destroy ourselves in ignorance. And I understand that weapons are not a good idea. I believe that. I really do. However, let's look at the reality that we're in. Okay? Um, there have been many really holy spiritual men that have been murdered. Okay? They literally went to death holding unconditional love. And that's great. Okay? However, and this is my perspective. Uh, if somebody is coming in my front door to harm my family, I'm taking them out. And I'll make no bones about it. Um, but they would have to be coming after my family. The, uh, the Andromedans, <laughs> Um, they're, not a, they're not happy with, with our society, with any of it. Um, but they realize we cannot defend ourselves. That's why they and other groups are contemplating intervention, because we can't defend ourselves. And we do have a serious threat. And you can hold the space of love. You know, I truly believe you can hold the space of love, but at the same time, you can hold the space of sovereignty and defiance of tyranny. Um, I mean, what good is total unconditional love when it's being totally suppressed? If we take that attitude, then don't we then create a situation where we have to come back and do it from the other side? Don't we just get right back involved in the whole cause and effect? Well, that's, that could be very possible. It could very well be possible. Um, I really don't have an answer for that. 
you know, like I said, I, I've got my stuff and I'm, I'm working it out. The symbols that you drew on the board, are they considered a universal language or are they part of the Andromedan uh, culture? And also, are the Andromedans taught to focus on those symbols in order to create reality like we are here in the school? Uh, good question. I do not know if they're universal. Um, again, I have, I've only met two other races with the Andromedans. I did not speak with them, but I saw them and then was told later who they were. And um, one was a group from Cygnus Alpha, Cygnus Alpha, a human race from Cygnus Alpha, and um, a very different looking being from Cassiopeia. I did not know the communications that were going on, um, but as far as the symbols, it's their language. And it's just one of a gazillion that they use. But I don't know that it's universal. I, I, I just don't know if the, you know all the other races know it. I mean, it could very well be that you know when the council gets together, they have interpreters who interpret the holographs, just like our UN does. I don't really know. So I'm sorry, my information on that is so limited. Yes. Please tell us a story about a time that you have observed on how the Andronomans treat their children. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Who are those faces? Me. Okay. <laughs> they treat their children like adults. Um, I understand that they birth in water, the gestation period is eight months, um, the children come out and they have full cognizant memory of who they were the life before. So there is a continuous evolution, life after life after life. Now during the period between incarnations, and I, I don't know if this happens for all the beings on fifth density or not. Um, the oldest and the wisest who have the most experience teach the youngest. So it's not where they withhold anything. In fact, the children, and this is the law of consistency, the children know everything their parents know and even more. And there's, there's no attitude with the parents. You know, this is something they want because their pride is in their race. And I uh, wish we had the same philosophy. God, we dumb them down with cartoons and stuff like that. Okay, the, the question was, when I was with them for three months, did I observe um, something with them in the park? They sit in circles. Um, again, they're telepathic. Um, so they would just be in, in circles and you would see them nodding and smiling and laughing, but there's no sound. <laughs> so I can't tell you what they were saying. <laughs> you know, it would be like if you went to a convention of deaf mutes, you know, and it's just sign language. You have no clue what's going on. You know, but they're, they're talking about incredible things, I'm sure. Things that are probably way over my head, and most things are actually. <laughs> So, um, but they treat them like adults. Um, and, and again, they, they teach them everything from a very young age. I mean, they go to school for 150 years. You know, God, you gotta pick up some stuff after that. <laughs> you know, you know, and there's no home ec and stuff like that. I mean, it's like real educational stuff. You know, no, no car mechanics 102 or anything like that. Yes, sir. Um, my question has to do with uh, the seeding of this planet by the Andromedans originally. You've mentioned uh, 62,000 years ago in a, in a time period of only 65 years, but I'm specifically interested, do you know of any symbols or any um, information about reawakening latent genetics in, 
for and you know people who are on this planet and is there any relationship of Lemuria to that 62,000 year ago time period Lemuria was in existence at that point um, Atlantis was just beginning to be colonized now folks let me get you set you straight on something or, or what the Andromedan perspective is Atlantis was an extraterrestrial colony okay I, I know that there's a lot of channeled stuff and, and uh, other stuff that's done in remote viewing and I personally I don't know if it's all true or if it's not true but the Andromedan perspective is is that Atlantis was an extraterrestrial colony sp specifically Lemuria was also however there were there were some of us Terrans there okay and we were servants more or less okay um, some of the stronger genetic of our race were used as a priesthood to basically keep in line the other humans I mean it, you know if you if you go back and you look at history through Samaria Egypt even today you know today the new priesthood is the world bankers you know they have total control of your life on a monetary physical level you know it's hard to do anything on this planet without money and they're the new priesthood um, as far as latent DNA and latent memories I have been told and I, I, I for some reason I don't know why I can't find my specific dates uh, but there will be a point where as the frequency increases that we will start to remember things children today are already remembering things there are children today who can just speak all these different languages and that, that are not earth languages uh, some of them are extinct languages from earth that some of these children just know and it's the latent uh, memory in the DNA that is coming out and uh, more and more of this will be occurring I know that there are children today I know of a woman who's contacted me who lives in Tennessee she has a child who came to her one day and says you know mom if I were to reverse engineer a nuclear bomb and explode it it would draw all the radiation out of here you know this kid's six years old <laughs> and you know there are children today over in Egypt that are walking out into the desert and showing archaeologists well I remember there was something there a library and sure enough they're digging and they're finding the foundations of things you know and um, our government probably does know because of its satellite technology but there's no way a 10 11 12 year old kid should know that stuff because it's all being suppressed so the um, you know the the world powers have a real serious problem people are waking up and it's great we have to we've been you know we've been we've been our heritage has been denied us it's we've been robbed of it and um, don't let it go don't let it go we we need to know who we are thanks that was a good question yes ma'am let's just take a few more okay folks I'm I'm pretty tired okay two more if there's two people yes ma'am I ma wanted to know you said um, they were taking the children and the eating of children or the eating of people and then while I was down there you said you would you talked about eating of children or people <laughs> and uh, while I was there you said it was the, because of the purity of the passion and emotion brought up the the fear the high fear and the high adrenal activity was attractive to them I understand that but an advanced technology it would seem to me would be able to clone their food or clone we can make adrenaline supplements or different things okay now I want you to look at this idea when is anything that's a clone as good as the original okay which what, what you what you don't what you fail to realize is yeah they can create clones and they have human clones but you cannot put soul in it okay you may grow a 
a, a, a micro, an organic processor in the brain to get them to act and do everything, but there's no soul attached to it. And as long as there's no soul, you don't have true emotion. True emotion? Well, your adrenaline rush. Okay, if I were to go over and do something to you and scare the hell out of you, okay, you would have, you would have a very serious emotional rush. Okay? They're addicted to the peaking of that emotional rush. It's like a narcotic to them because they don't have it. That's why they're so interested in us. They're, they're numb. They're numb. Their physicalities are numb. They're all in their head. They're in self-imposed loneliness. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, they do. The question was, do they terrify the children? And I said, yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Do you have any information that you can give us that would shed light on the mystery of gravity on this plane? <laughs> <laughs> and is it indigenous to this planet? Um, or is it a mutation? And Say that again. Is there what? Is it indigenous to here, to the solar system? Gravity? Yes, to Earth. Or is it a mutation? And uh, would it disappear when the frequencies um, begin to raise? Okay. The Andromedan perspective regarding gravity is that it is created by radiation from the sun and our planet. Um, we're told that it's the rotation of the planet on its axis. Their perspective is that it has to do with radiation from the sun. And they say that any physical body that is uh, 29 miles or larger has a gravitational field. Um, I've exp they have gravity on the, on the Andromedan craft. And I would assume that's for a reason, so that they could get more done, so they're not just floating all over the place. Um, I don't believe it's a mutation. There's gravity on all the fields because there's a physicality. Um, so there has to be some form. Uh, whether or not it's going to totally disappear, I think as we move through three, four, and into fifth, I think we will deal with a totally different type of gravity as we know it. It'll probably be lighter, but then again, we will have different physical form as well. Um, but again, they say that it comes from the sun. It's the, it's the radiation from the sun that creates gravity on our world. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh. I have two questions. One quickly. Um, they display mutual respect and love, but I'd like to know how they do that. And the second question, in our society, all of our myths and legends seem to be blueprints for our lives. And I'd like to know what kinds of myths and legends, if they have them, that they have. I know you probably don't have time to tell us one tonight. If you would, I'd love it. But, you know, if you could get that information for Val, I'd love to have that. Okay. They don't call, their, they don't call them myths. They call it history. Okay. <laughs> and I will give those to Val. All right, and you're right, there's, there's a lot, but it's history. We have taken truth and shrouded it as myth because we're hiding an agenda. Um, how do they show mutual respect? They just honor every aspect of their life and everybody else's life. Because they're so evolved, there's no such thing as crime there. There's, you know, there's no laser shootings on, on a mothership. You know, there's no... Uh, <laughs> Um, they, they need for nothing. They absolutely need for nothing. Anything that they need is given to them um, for evolvement. And they all work towards that. Um, they wouldn't think about leaving somebody behind. You know, I'll give you a good example of that too. There was a ship and, uh, an extraterrestrial craft that was apparently shut down in 1985. I believe it was 1985. And it was a human being from Tal Ceti who literally got too close and he was shot down. I understand that our military was able to take him, took him underground somewhere in Arizona, put him on a car, a train, took him underground to North Dakota, 
where they started doing some really horrific things. Morinet told me that a Tau Ceti fleet wanted to come in and invade our planet, particularly North Dakota, to get this guy back. Okay? And it was literally the Andromedans and the Pleiadians, a benevolent group of Pleiadians, that stepped in and said, whoa, no, not yet. It's not the time. Um, that's mutual respect. It's not leaving POWs in Vietnam because you owe this, because you promised the government three billion dollars. It's not leaving men in North Korea because you lied, because you're dealing drugs. And you don't want you, you don't want everybody else to know. That's that's you know that's not mutual respect. Um, they would never ever think to do something like that. And um, you know those are those are. So those are things, those are characteristics we need to look at. Because there are many in this room that probably know about that. I mean, there are right now, as we, as, as we are standing here right today, there are 117 men still left in, in SPOWs. But they're not in Vietnam, okay? They're being held in northern Laos. There are also uh, three men that are still alive from the Korean War, still being held in North Korea. And our government knows and they know. A lot of the POWs were used for scientific experiments. We did it to some of their guys using drugs, LSD, you know, we like blew their minds. And they've done some pretty horrific things to our people. Um, you know, these are all real character, character issues and, you know, it's one thing to hear about it in the news or to listen to uh, you know, Joyce Riley talk about the Gulf War syndrome and how our guys have been betrayed. You know, it's one thing to sit in your living room and say, oh my God, that's terrible. But what you don't understand is that we are very carefully being watched by some incredible races, both good and bad. And they are watching us and our characteristics, what we will do, what we will not do. They are measuring our honor and intent. Okay? It's not just about us anymore. It's about everything. And I know you're, you're probably being taught that. So when you hear stuff like this, please don't go into your little box, okay? Those people had families. They had children, just like you do now. And it was all taken away because they were betrayed. And betrayal is a major issue that we're all going to have to deal with when the truth finally does come screaming out. Okay? We have been betrayed. And we're going to have to come together and find a way to totally forgive that so that we can move on. But in forgiving it, it's important not to allow it to happen again. To be more diligent. To be more vigilant. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm so tired. I don't even have my notes. Okay, it's on the internet. All right, the Earth Changes is on the internet. Most of you already know. Okay, you're looking for dates, specific dates, what time, so on and so forth. That's not important. It is definitely coming, but it's all a probability as to when. All right? But there are more people po negatively polarized on the planet that it's almost a sure thing that it's going to happen at this point. The internet is a leading edge research group. I'm sorry? Um, yeah, he's free to do whatever he wants. None of this has a copyright. None of the tapes, the newsletters, nothing. You know, um, it's not mine. I don't own it. I'm just here to deliver it. So you can do whatever you want with it. Just don't change the intent, okay? Just don't change the intent. Alex, we have some of your newsletters that you sent, and I'm going to have them in the uh, bookstore for people. There's not enough for everybody, but there's quite a few for those of you who are interested. We'll also post the address for that newsletter for everybody, so if they want to get those kinds of specific okay. dates, they'll be available to them. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. It is behind, it is behind the one we see. Here, I'll show you what I mean. Okay, this is the sun. This is earth, 
and her moon. The second one is smaller, it is behind it. If you're standing on Mars, you see it. Okay? You see it. As it turns, now the reason it was done, the reason we were, our planet was moved is because we could, the planet, the surface could not handle the radiation of two suns after the last war that was here. So they had to do something about moving it. Now, when I asked, well, who moved this? The response I got from Warren A, and this is the only answer I got, was that this is something the Pleiadians had to answer. So I don't know if there's an agreement for them to bring this information out, or if they were responsible for it, I don't know. Okay? Um, but apparently there is some evidence coming to light that they clearly suspect that there are two. Okay? Um, let's see, hold on, hold on. I want to I wanna end this with, I want to re uh, read something, and I want to thank the gentleman in the back for bringing this up. Um, I have a very deep respect for the Native Americans. And um, I, just, I just think that they're, they're great. They have really tried to hold on to their integrity uh, through it all. Um, they, they themselves, which I witnessed at the Star Visions Conference, still have major prejudices with the white race. And whether they're justified or not, what happens to us happens to them. So we all need to drop it, and we need to come to the table. We need to bring all the wisdom to the table so that we can figure out together how we're going to deal with the situations that are coming. There are still some Native Americans that choose to withhold information regarding the, the star nations, the star races. That's OK. That's fine. What I can tell you is that there will be others come up, coming up behind them and making sure that humanity gets the information. Because we have to know the truth. It's the only way we can make the right decisions. You cannot make the correct decision with only half the truth. It's still the wrong decision. Or it could still backfire because we don't know all the pieces of the puzzle. You know? And uh, from what little I do know, it appears that all of you are truly blessed to be able to come to a school like this and get the information that you need so that you can go out and teach others. And folks, I want to stress this again. It is imperative that you take the knowledge that you have, that you've been given, and you teach others. We are running out of time, all right? We can, we can really turn this around, but we have to do it right away, and you have to be committed to it. Um, I mean, I can't stress this enough. I mean, time is so short as we know it. And, I, you know, I, I don't think it's fair that two-thirds of the planet are not going to make it because they have not been told the truth. It just isn't fair. But, you know, I didn't make up this game, or maybe I did, part of it. Um, but it, if I did, then I'm, I'm an idiot because it isn't working, okay? It, it isn't fair. Um, there are a lot of good people on the planet who are real simple people. And, uh, you know, they... They're just not being told the truth. Now, they may not want to believe it, but that's okay. At least you put it out there, and they made a choice. But unless it's put out there, they won't know that there's a choice. Okay, and that's all you can do. You're not really responsible for anybody else but yourself. Okay, I'm going to read this. Oh, great spirit, whose breath gives life to all the world, Hear me. I am small and weak. I need your strength and your wisdom. Let me walk in beauty and make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things that you have made and taught my people. Make me wise so that I might understand the things you have taught my people. Let me learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and every rock. I see strength not to be greater than my brother, but to fight my greatest enemy, myself. So when life fades as the fading sunset, and my spirit may come, and as life fades as the fading sunset, please let my spirit come to you without shame. Washte. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
Now, uh, didn't you guys think that was worth listening to? There's a lot he didn't tell you. We'll get him next time. Thank you.